is appropriate to pause to party at certain times in our life. We're continuing a series that is the gift of Sabbath, the blessing of God that he invited us in the rhythms of life to take time to pause one out of seven days to worship, to gather together as his people. Today we want to focus on pausing to party. That's what we did last weekend, right? Many of you, I know, were able to be here last Sunday as we celebrated five years of our life together as faith. And uh, what a wonderful celebration that was. Thanks again to all who are a part of that day. Thanks to each of you that have been a vital part of faith from its beginning. Thanks to the anniversary committee for all their wonderful work, for people that cooked the food. My belly celebrated. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We praise you for all your blessings. We thank you that you have invited us in the rhythms of our life to take time regularly to pause, to celebrate, to worship. So thank you for this morning, for the privilege that is ours to be your people together. And may you come and receive our praises. May you hear our prayers. And we thank you for the promises in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who doesn't love a good party? So help me out. What are the elements of a good party? Absolutely. Got to be food. What else? Friends. People you cherish. What else? Entertainment. Absolutely. Anything else? Laughter. Good conversation together. Family being there. Music. You're doing good. A shade tree. (laughs) What if it's inside, Gary? Do you bring the tree in? Yeah? Thank you. Decorations. It's got to be festive, right? We got to put on all the best and make it colorful and festive and fun. There's all kinds of elements in the ways that we choose to celebrate a number of occasions. And almost always, by the way, you know, we love to party. Would you agree with the statement, life is a party? Okay, let that thought just kind of simmer there. (laughs) I'd suggest you life is a party. Let's talk about why. Usually it's a point of significance like Doug shared so well with our children today, there's usually something appropriate. There's a significance to the party getting together. Maybe it's a great victory. Maybe it's to honor some person in our lives that we cherish, some milestone in life. But the celebration is important for all of us. And it's true with biblical examples of parties too. And that's what I want us to talk about is that it's God's intent that we would pause to celebrate. Why is that? If we hit the pause button in life, all the type A personalities go, because they don't want to stop the parade in order to shut down and party. They just want to plow ahead, keep working hard, time's a-wasting, got to make hey, while the sun shines, all those little phrases we use, right? All the type A personalities find it hard to disengage, let go, and party. But there's a value in parties, and that's what I want us to unpack for a few minutes. In biblical times, when they celebrated, almost always it was on the heels of some great victory of God or some significant moment of what God was doing among his people and almost always if you read the biblical witness what they did when they partied was they built an altar how many of you when you're going to have a birthday party or celebrate your wedding build a little altar probably not right maybe in your home 
There's a place in your house where you go to worship. Maybe that's your altar, so to speak. Is it at the kitchen table? Is it in your easy chair in the corner? Is it up in your bedroom? Maybe there's a place where you build an altar, so to speak, and you worship God. So in the crossing of the Red Sea, they worshiped, and Miriam led the chorus of the songs of the people on that great day. But there are other times, you remember after the flood, Noah and his family built an altar. Other times, when they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, they built an altar and they worshiped. In our prayer time before worship today, Bill Nitzel read a passage from Second Samuel about the day that the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem and David danced before the Lord and his wife Michael was extremely critical. But there are moments where we got to party, we got to celebrate because God has done awesome things. Or in the passage that Jim read for us about Mary's Magnificat, where she praised God when she was visited by the angel Gabriel and said, there's life growing within your womb, even though you're a virgin, and the child within you is the Son of God. And she praised God for the favor of being a part of His plan. So our parties maybe can even be a party of one sometimes. You can walk your fields out behind your house and you can look up into the heavens, the stars. You can watch the sun come up or the sun go down. You can be all by yourself and you can still have your own personal little party with God because it's really an attitude of praise in your heart. In the biblical witness, every time they partied, they also worshipped the Lord. There's an interesting phrase in the Psalms. It says, God inhabits the praises of his people. Let that roll through your mind again. God inhabits the praises of his people. Somehow when you and I come together, we invoke the presence of the living God. The Spirit is among us. We sing his praise. And God comes and is there in the praise. There's three examples. I probably could think of more if I took some time, but I want to share three examples that come to my mind from my life experience. You'd have them, too, of times where I felt the presence of God. On several occasions, Denise and I have been with different colleges in a Christmas concert where choirs and orchestra are all gathered, and it's put together in such a beautiful way and the praises of those young voices in the chorus are singing praise to God as they retell the story of salvation or the birth of Jesus and sometimes when you're there your heart just resonates with that praise and you feel the presence of God when that happens I don't know how many of you are here that went on that trip to Haiti to Jockmill how many of you? All right, put your hands up. Be proud. Do you remember sitting in that little dining room on the orphanage campus and hearing those children in the orphanage sing praise to the Lord Jesus? A unique sound of voice, but I felt like God was there inhabiting the praises of those children. And the third time might seem bizarre to you, but I think about my funeral, my, my brother Joel's funeral. Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Four City, Iowa, was packed with people. He was a young man, after all, involved in a lot of circles of life. The church was packed, and somehow everybody who came to his funeral could sing. I'll tell you what, because the rafters shook as people sang, I know that my Redeemer lives. You see, the paradox is, and that was true in the hymn we just sang before my message, that sometimes we offer our praise to God and we even revel in the truth that God is victorious even if the days are dark or the way is difficult. 
even then all that God has promised he is or the victory that he has won for us in Jesus Christ is still true. And maybe especially in those dark moments, we need to pause to party. We need to pause to praise God. And as we say, God inhabits the praises of his people. So in the passage that we read from Exodus 15, it's a story led by Miriam after the Exodus event. You remember what was happening Fresh on the heels of the ten plagues, they come out into the wilderness a day or two ride into the desert, and they come up against the Red Sea. Pharaoh has now processed all that's happened, including the death of his firstborn, and now he's ticked off, and he wants revenge. So he summons his whole army, chariots and fighters, his best champions, and they're pursuing God's people who are wandering into the wilderness and now against the Red Sea with no way to cross. And so the Red Sea is a barrier in front of them, and the chariots of Pharaoh are bearing down on them, and they say to Moses, wasn't there enough death in the country of Egypt that you brought us out into the wilderness to perish? They complained to Moses, and they complained to God. And Moses was discouraged, but then God gave him a word, and he said, stretch forth your staff. And the waters we know parted before them, and they crossed over on dry land. And then as Pharaoh pursued them even into the Red Sea, the waters came back together, and God defeated Pharaoh and his army. Now here's the truth, which is worth celebrating as a victory that the very element or the very circumstance that was in fact part of the problem which was the source of such great fear became the tool that God used to gain victory that's how awesome your God is that he can use the very circumstance of your life that induces the fear, that paralyzes your heart, and he can use that moment to show you his presence and his power in such a way that you say, the Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my savior. He's a warrior that fights for me. The Lord will rule forever. Did you know that divers in the Red Sea have discovered remnants of the chariots of Pharaoh's army at the bottom of the Red Sea. Google it yourself. See pictures. There are images of chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea as a proof of the historic reality of what God did for his people to deliver them from Pharaoh. What else did they do? I'm back to Dell's comment, every party should have food. You know what? Every time that they celebrated and partied as God's people, they feasted. To this day, as a celebration of the Exodus, devout Jews will celebrate the Passover, a remembrance of the sacrifice of the lamb, the blood on the doorpost, and God's great deliverance to keep them as his people, keep them safe. We remember in the New Testament, the story of the prodigal son. You remember how after the prodigal had wandered away from his father, treated him as dead, he came back to his father, broke and broken, destitute, telling his father he didn't deserve to be his son, and his father threw his arms around him, put his robe on him, gave him his signet ring as the authority as son in his house, and said, we're going to have a party. The elder son comes in, and what happens? The elder son doesn't want a party. So here's the truth. When we as God's people praise God, not everyone is going to join the party. Not everyone will want to party. Do you know what God's reason to celebrate is? You. Think about that. You, it says in Isaiah 43, are precious and important. You are honored in God's sight. God's reason to celebrate with joy is his love 
for you. I remember visiting with a couple of people who were in a recovery process. They were midstream through their rehabilitation. They were discouraged. They were feeling physically terrible. One woman in particular had had a very hard life. And because of her addiction, she was estranged from her daughter, divorced from her husband, estranged from her own family. She was alone in the world. She was at the bottom. She was court-ordered to be there in that detox, in that rehab center. And I said, you know what God thinks of you? And I read from Isaiah 43. God says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You belong to me. You're precious in my sight. And you are honored. And I love you. And I continued to talk, which preachers are good at just jabbering away. But the tears started rolling down that woman's cheek at the truth that the God who gave her life think she's precious. God's reason to celebrate is you because he cherishes you even as he holds you close to his heart. They feasted because they understood grace. They understood God's deliverance. It says in the scriptures, the angel rejoiced with every person who repents of their sin. Now I am not Ignorant, nor foolish enough to think that all of us who are assembled here are walking really close with the Lord. So I want to say to you today, in the name of Jesus Christ, that today is a great day to celebrate grace. Today is a great day to say, I've been off the mark. I'm like a train that's derailed. I am not walking close to God. But I know that in the name of Jesus, God offers me forgiveness. I'm going to come home. I'm going to come home like the prodigal came back to the father's house. And the angels will throw a party because today's the day that you've said, I want to walk with God. Now one of the things that you didn't say about parties because we're in church is that a lot of people who party have too much to drink of stuff that is toxic. The booze. And we use the term, they are intoxicated, right? That's a term that basically means they're smashed. They are drunk. Isn't it interesting that the center of that word is toxic because it's poison. It can ruin a person's life. The opposite, though it is a biblical analogy for how God is at work in the believer's life, is that we're under the influence. So how does somebody get drunk or intoxicated? They drink it in, right? So how are you, as a child of God, going to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You're going to consciously drink it in. You're going to say in your prayers, Lord Jesus, fill me with your Spirit. Fill me up. Fill me up again till I am under the influence of your loving spirit to the point where it affects how I think, how I see, how I speak, how I carry myself in life. I'm going to live under the influence. Why? Because I've paused in the presence of Almighty God and I've partied. Could you say that? Could you say I am under the influence? I'm filled with the Spirit of God. In fact, I walk with God by faith. Fill me again. This is a morning for you to say it as we're together in worship. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need your joy. I need to be reminded of your victory for me. So what's the result of pausing to party? I suggest to you that it's euphoric joy. Unlike someone who's had too much to drink where they lose control, a gift of the Holy Spirit 
is self-control. So somehow we are filled with the Spirit so that we are restored to our right mind and we are under the control of the Spirit of the One who made us. And so you can skip your way out of this building saying, I'm a child of God. I've got joy, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. Life might be hard. I don't always know how to approach life, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. I've paused long enough to realize how many blessings God has given me. Life becomes an adventure of following Jesus Christ. You never know where it will lead you, do you? But if your ear is tuned in to the Spirit of Jesus guiding, life is an adventure. You belong to Him. And your focus is not on how you feel or your weakness. Your focus is on God's capacity. So someone once said, if praise is the language of heaven, let's start speaking it now. Have you ever heard that? If praise is the language of heaven, let's start speaking it now. So I, if you're willing, and I won't know. Yeah, I will. I can see your mouths if they stay closed. If you're willing, I want you to praise God with me for these reasons. Jesus has forgiven all your sins. Please say with me, Jesus has forgiven me. Jesus has forgiven me. Now say it with praise and exuberance. Jesus has forgiven me. Here's another one. Death does not have the final word because Jesus has made you eternally alive. Would you say with me, Jesus gives me eternal life. Jesus gives me eternal life. Also, Jesus is more than the Savior who forgives all my sins and gives me eternal life. He's the one who lives within me as my friend. Can you say, Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my friend. That's a reason to party, you see. If you could say every day, I am forgiven in the name of Jesus. I will never die. I'm eternally alive. And Jesus is not only the Lord of the universe, He's my friend. So you pause every day and party. Because those things are true for you. Amen.